Kingdom to spill more secrets, details, and Easter eggs in some of the most popular rides in the park. I did this a few weeks ago and you said give us more. So I'm headed to six different attractions to spill all the imaginary magic that makes these attractions so great. I hope you're ready, I hope you're excited. We got a lot to do. haven't seen the first episode of this. This is the series where I go around to the popular rides in all the parks and share all of that goodness. In the first version of this Magic Kingdom secret series, I focus primarily on the other side of the park. Some Adventureland, some Frontierland, Liberty Square. So today we are going to focus on Fantasyland and Tomorrowland and we have one of my favorite rides in the park to kick us off. Kicking this day off by blasting off into space, the first ride we're going to talk about today is the ever-popular, much-beloved Space Mountain. Space Mountain is the one and only thrill ride we'll be talking about today, considering we covered Thunder, Splash, and Seven Doors Mine Train in the last video. But Space Mountain is also my favorite of the Magic Kingdom Mountains. But did you know it's also the slowest? It doesn't even crack 30 miles an hour. It tops out at 28 miles an hour, which is slower than Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. It's slower than the drop on Splash Mountain. It's slower than Seven Doors Mine Train. And it's only three miles per hour faster than the Barnstormer, the kids' coaster right next door. But it's the illusion of going fast that makes this attraction so fun. It's basically in pitch black dark, so you don't know where you're going, you don't know when the dips are going to hit, you don't know where you're going to twist and turn, so it makes you feel like you're going much faster and dropping at a much more steep incline than you actually are. The steepest incline on this attraction is only 39 degrees, so it's really structurally not as scary as some other attractions here, but again, the dark makes it seem that way. One of the reasons I love Space Mountain so much is that it is one of the rare attractions that debuted here in Walt Disney World as opposed to being a duplicate from Disneyland. Disneyland opened in 1955, Walt Disney World opened in 1971, and a lot of the initial attractions here at Walt Disney World were duplicates of the successful ones over in California. But Space Mountain debuted here in Magic Kingdom in 1975. It was actually the first indoor roller coaster and the first roller coaster in the world to be controlled by computers. The technology was so advanced that they actually dreamt it up in the early 1960s, but weren't able to build it because technology hadn't caught up with their idea until the mid 70s. Disney also employed the help of real astronauts like astronaut Gordon Cooper to help them build this attraction. He was not only there along with some of his astronaut buddies at the debut of the attraction, but he helped Disney Imagineers make this feel as close to space travel as they could in the early 70s. I find that particularly interesting because they did the same thing decades later when they opened Mission Space over at Epcot, where NASA astronauts took five years partnered alongside Disney to make that attraction come to life. So I just love that Disney's been reaching out to the experts for basically all time. Last thing to mention before we go jump aboard Space Mountain is the outdoor structure of the attraction. Besides Cinderella Castle, this is probably the most iconic structure in the Magic Kingdom. And that's because of the beams being on the outside of the building. But did you know those are actually the support beams? Those buildings are actually what's keeping this building up. They realized if they wanted to project stars and asteroids and comets along the ceiling and along the walls during your space travel, having those integral beams on the wall would disrupt those projections and take you out of the feeling of flying through space. So John Hench, a genius architect, a fabulous Imagineer who's also responsible for building Cinderella Castle, figured out how to support the building by putting the beams on the outside, giving Space Mountain its iconic look. Also talking about the castle, Space Mountain is 183 feet tall, which is barely shorter than Cinderella Castle at 189 feet tall. However, based on forced perspective, based on where this angles throughout the park, it doesn't seem quite that large. It doesn't seem like it's only just a few feet smaller than the castle. However, it still is a very imposing and dominating structure, and it's really a peak of Tomorrowland when you look at Space Mountain. Now, that's enough fun facts. I can't really tell you things to look for on the attraction, considering it's in the pitch black, but we're gonna go ride it and I'll point out a few things in the queue and when we get off. The Space Mountain has a 44 inch height requirement, making it the tallest in this park. It also is different than Disneyland's in a few ways. First being that you sit in front of each other single. So because of that, sometimes it stresses out little ones because they're not actually sitting next to anyone um, during this dark attraction. A fun thing to look for in the queue. Now the entire theme of Tomorrowland is to be kind of 
this Jules Vernian version of the future, and it's supposed to depict an intergalactic trading port, which is why a lot of the shops, restaurants, attractions have names like Star Traders, because that's where you would trade things. And it's important to note that Space Mountain is taking place in Starport 75, which is not to when the attraction first opened, 1975. Space Mountain is very popular and can get very long waits. However, it tends to ebb and flow a little bit more than other popular thrill rides at this park, particularly more so than Splash Mountain or Seven Doors Mine Train. If you're purchasing Genie Plus, this is a great use of Genie Plus, but not one of your first priorities. If you're not using Genie Plus, you can usually get on this attraction with a 45 minute wait or less. Just keep an eye on it throughout the day. It tends to drop in the mid afternoon. Another main difference between Space Mountain here and Space Mountain in Disneyland is that the Space Mountain here has two different tracks, Alpha and Omega. They're mere sisters of each other. Alpha is about 10 feet taller than Omega. But at Disneyland, they only had room to build one track, which is why you do have that side-by-side -side seating, so the capacity can remain the same with half the amount of track, which is really just an example of the whole main difference between Disneyland and Walt Disney World. In Disneyland, they're very constrained for size because it's built in the middle of a city, whereas in Disney World, they were able to acquire acres and acres of land and build as much as they wanted. And as an additional ride tip, if it's busy and you don't mind splitting up for your party or you are a single rider, let the cast member know that's going to send you either to the right or left to Alpha or Omega that you're a single rider. And again, if it's busy, they'll send you behind everybody else and you will probably board faster. Today it's not super busy, so I didn't feel the need to go around, but that's just a little ride trick that not a lot of people realized. As you exit your rocket ship, ungracefully I assume, there is no attractive way to get out of these cars. I have ridden this ride a hundred times and I've never gotten out of it without flashing someone. But you're going to see signs that say things like welcome to Tomorrowland Space Travelers and that you're at the MK Space Station because again we're doing that theme of this being an intergalactic trading port. But there's a very cool detail to look for on the way out very excited. As you leave the attraction, you will see different versions of what it's like to live in space. You see different companies advertising, traveling, so things like this space dog, because you can go to Crater Canyons. It's kind of like when you get at an airport and there's billboards for things you can do in that city. That's what they're doing here. There's different activities and different touristy places you could check out now that you've made it to space. You have things like luxury hotels advertising, uh, as well as outdoor adventures like Blunking and space caverns. One of the things you'll see along the exit is this baggage claim here. And if you take a look at these bumper stickers, there's a few that have Easter eggs for former Disney attractions. First of all, this one right here, Space Station X1, that's a nod to an old attraction in Tomorrowland in Disneyland in the 1950s. And Mesa Verde right here is the fictional space place in Horizons, the now extinct Epcot attraction. You also see a, one right here for Tiki Sam's, nod to Trader Sam. Uh, who is a character from the Jungle Cruise and has the tiki bars both here and Disneyland. This is probably my favorite Easter egg. If you look at this space command port with the robot here, there's a lot of things snuck into the codes, but the best thing to look for is the open sectors and the closed sectors because each of those alphanumeric combos are a nod to a either newer open attraction or a closed attraction. Now I say recently reopened with a grain of salt because this attraction was last updated in the early 2000s but if you look at the open sectors you'll see that they're giving you a code for what land it's in by doing FL that's Fantasyland, AL that's Adventureland etc. FLMAWP Mini Adventures of Winnie the Pooh then you've got ALAFC Aladdin's Flying Carpets FLMPM that's Mickey's Philhar Magic FRL is Splash Mountain for Frontierland TL BLSRS Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Spin and the long one there at the end of Tomorrowland that begins with MILF well that's the Monsters Inc. Laugh Floor now looking at the In Memoriam the closed sectors. Again, you've got the codes for what land they were in. So for Fantasyland, you have 20,000 leagues under the sea. Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Sorry, Max. In Tomorrowland, you've got SK2FL. That was the Skyway to Fantasyland, those sky buckets, the OG Skyliner here that, that connected the two lands. 
on MSU, that's Main Street USA, you have the Swan Boats. In Fantasyland, MMR, that is the Mickey Mouse Review. And in Tomorrowland, M2M, that's Mission to Mars. Is that not such a cool Easter egg? Awesome. Scooting out of Tomorrowland quick and headed to Fantasyland. We'll be back into Tomorrowland. We're going to end there because it's always a great big beautiful tomorrow when you're here. But for now, it's off to Neverland. Welcome to Fantasyland, aka Stroller Gridlock this time of day. This is the reason I purchased Genie Plus today because I have a lot of Fantasyland rides to get done and this is the busiest part of the park in the afternoon. So as a pro tip to you, avoid Fantasyland in the mid-afternoon. Either come first thing as a resort guest or in that early park entry or in the evening time. Because right now it's just a sea of bodies. One thing to note about Fantasyland here in the Magic Kingdom is that it is themed to be a fair for the royals that live inside Cinderella Castle. Which, of course, Cinderella. Prince Charming, presumably his dad, probably not her siblings, but that's why you have this look of it being like a tent. That's why it doesn't look like a permanent attraction at things like Mickey's Philhar Magic, which was Mickey Mouse Review, Peter Pan's Flight, and It's a Small World. And while it looks very nice and it's become the aesthetic we're all used to here in Fantasyland, it's actually because they were running behind schedule and were scrambling and they put up temporary tent-like structures and then it ended up working so well that they just kept it and it's been this way for 50 years. As you can see, this choke point between Peter Pan's flight and It's a Small World headed to Liberty Square is very tight. The lightning lane is very far back. So I'm gonna pull off to the side, tell you some fun facts, and then we will jump aboard our pirate ship off to Neverland. Peter Pan's Flight is an almost opening day attraction here in the Magic Kingdom. It opened up two days late on October 3rd, 1971, because they were having some technical difficulties and couldn't open on October 1st. But it was an opening day attraction out at Disneyland, and it's been one of the most beloved attractions ever since at both parks. This is an attraction that still, over 50 years later, still has a consistent 80 minute wait. It's that popular. A big difference here in the Magic Kingdom and out at Disneyland is in the time between the two parks being open, Disney developed the very famous Omni Mover attraction for the 6465 New York's World's Fair. That's that style of attraction where you get on a conveyor belt, your ride vehicles never stop moving, like Haunted Mansion Doom buggies, Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger spin. And while this is a slightly modified version of it, it is an Omni Mover attraction here. Another big difference between Magic Kingdom and Disneyland is that animatronics were invented in between opening there and the opening here. Here. Animatronics didn't exist until 1963 when they debuted at the Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room in Adventureland in Disneyland. Again, this attraction opened in 1955 there, so there they just had kind of more crude mechanical figures, whereas here when it opened, they had the ability to create the animatronics, so they created ones of Peter, Hook, Wendy, the Lost Boys, and all the characters you know and love. And speaking of Peter Pan, he didn't actually appear in the original attraction. Initially, you were supposed to be taking on the role of Peter Pan as you went through and seeing his friends, the Darling family, the Lost Boys, and his nemesis, Captain Hook. But a lot of guests didn't understand that, and they're like, where's Peter Pan? So when they opened the attraction here, they included animatronics of Peter Pan, and eventually they added him out at Disneyland as well. This was a similar problem they had with Snow White Scary Adventures, an attraction that still exists in a modified form out at Disneyland, but was replaced by Princess Fairytale Hall here in the Magic Kingdom. Snow White wasn't anywhere to be seen when that attraction opened, because again, you as the guests were supposed to be seeing the story through the eyes of the main protagonist, but unfortunately, guests just didn't understand. Additionally, this was supposed to be a Mary Poppins attraction, it was going to be very similar to Peter Pan in that you were flying over London, but it was going to incorporate characters from the Julie Andrews classic. However, time constraints, money constraints got the best of them, and they realized it would be easier to duplicate and modify an attraction that already existed as opposed to creating a brand new one. They made that switch from Mary Poppins to Peter Pan very last minute, so late, in fact, that the concept artist... Bill Justice and Bill Martin didn't finish the concept art until February of 1971, just a few months before the attraction opened. So honestly, you can't fault them for being two days late. Bill Justice is best known for animating Chip and Dale and Bill Martin, a set designer for 20th Century Fox that Walt Disney actually poached. He worked on movies at 20th Century Fox and he was instrumental in the building of Magic Kingdom because what is a theme park if not just movie sets come to life that you're a part of? Also, just the irony of him poaching it from Fox, which Disney acquired like decades later. They just, they're running it. You know what I mean? Have been 
for a long time. Magic Kingdom wasn't the only park that struggled with opening this attraction on time. They had issues out in Disneyland as well. In fact, they had issues with opening basically everything in Disneyland on time, but they were so behind schedule in Disneyland that the main artists, Ken Anderson and Claude Coates, didn't even have time to plan out what they were going to paint. They just went and did it. However, it wasn't that difficult for them because they were both background artists and character artists on the movie Peter Pan, so they just applied what they did for film onto the attraction, and I think we can all agree it looks lovely. They were also so behind schedule out in Disneyland that they literally had the attraction set up in the Walt Disney Studio, not in Disneyland initially they had it set up in the studio they were using herb ryman's concept art he drew the main concept art for this attraction and i love herb ryman because he's also the gentleman responsible for drawing cinderella castle i should do a cinderella castle fun fact part wow these videos could go on forever i could do cinderella castle i could do main street i could do general themes in the lands things that aren't in attractions themselves things in restaurants you let me know but back to peter pan this attraction was revolutionary in its technology because since they wanted to imply that you were flying over Neverland like Peter and the gang, they had to literally make you fly. It's kind of funny if you watch the old videos of it at Disneyland, it's kind of like watching a meatpacking plant or a laundry facility, the way the vehicles stop and start as they're hanging. And that kind of gave them the inspiration for this attraction. And while it seems like you are flying way high in the sky, you're actually only 17 feet up at the highest part of the attraction. Disney is well known for using a a trick called force perspective which is making things smaller or bigger than they actually are to make it seem like you are farther away or something's more looming than it really is for example when you look down in the london scene and you look at all of those cars on a highway those are literally just tiny dots painted in glow-in-the-dark paint on a bicycle chain but because you're hanging above them because they've made everything much smaller than it really is it feels like you're hanging much higher than 17 feet up now the last thing I'm going to say before it's off to Neverland is one, when you're headed to this attraction, make sure you check out the weather banes as you are going to see the Jolly Roger as well as Tick Tock Croc hanging out on the ceiling of the attraction. Roof. I mean roof, like an outdoor ceiling. You get it. Additionally, when you sail off with Peter Pan in the initial part of the attraction, make sure you look down at the blocks in the Darling's Nursery because they spell out the word Disney. And for my Hidden Mickey fans, take a look at where the Lost Boys are and there is one painted on the flowers. And despite being an almost opening day attraction as well as being very short, it's only about two and a half minutes long, it remains, like I said, one of the most popular attractions in the park. If you are trying to ride Peter Pan's flight, this is a great thing to book very first thing with Genie Plus. That's what I did this morning, and I got a return time around 1 o'clock in the afternoon. If you're not purchasing Genie Plus but you're a resort guest, I recommend riding this one first thing during that early theme park entry. If you're not a resort guest, I would wait till later in the day. You can always jump in line at a ride very last thing at night. Or if you are a deluxe resort guest, this is a good one to ride during that extended evening hours. One thing that has made the 60, 70, 80 plus minute queues a little more bearable is that a few years ago they did redo the queue to be an interactive queue uh, that takes you through the Darling's Nursery with some fun interactive elements with Tinkerbell. Is it worth an 80 minute wait? However, if you can go through the standby interactive queue when it's less than 80 minutes, it is very cute and fun to see. Plus, you can see poor Nana for a father. Poor Nana. Poor Nana. Poor father. <laughs> quintessential Disney classic. <laughs> From one cherished classic to another, it's time to set sail on the happiest cruise that ever sailed and ride It's a Small World. 
It's a Small World was one of the four Disney attractions that made its debut at the 1964 65 New York's World's Fair, but it almost didn't happen. Disney was already working on great moments with Mr. Lincoln, Carousel of Progress, as well as the Ford Magic Skyway, which would become the People Mover, when they were approached by PepsiCo and UNICEF and asked if they were able to do another attraction. The idea was to do an attraction for UNICEF benefiting the children around the world. Now there's a rumor, there's a story, there's a legend that goes with this that somebody asked someone lower ranking in the Walt Disney Company if Disney would be interested in building this attraction. And this person said, I'm sorry, no, we've already got three attractions, we're already behind schedule, Disney can't do it. And this trickled up to Mr. Walt Disney's ears and he said, absolutely not, we're doing it, it's for a good cause and I don't want anyone to think Disney can't do something. So they added a fourth attraction, which would become one of the most beloved attractions of all time to their World's Fair roster. At that World's Fair, they sold over 10 million tickets at 95 cents each for an adult, 65 cents for children. But it was important for a lot of reasons. One of them being the boat that was invented to move people quickly through this attraction would be the predecessor to the boat we use on Pirates of the Caribbean, the Grand Fiesta Tour, and eventually would evolve into boats like Frozen Everest after a Navi River journey. Sure, there had been boat rides before, but the efficiency of this boat explicitly was able to move people through the facility very, very quickly. And so even though this was one of the most popular pavilions at that World's Fair, it consistently had one of the shortest lines because Disney had become masters of efficiency. Originally, it was gonna be called Children of the World before the name was changed to It's a Small World. And the original attraction from the fair now lives in Disneyland. But every Disney park around the world except for Shanghai has It's a Small World because it's become such a part of the cultural zeitgeist. It's a Small World is basically synonymous with the Disney brand, so much so that the song It's a Small World was inducted into the Library of Congress earlier this year because of its cultural relevance and impact on the world. Additionally, former Disney CEO Michael Eisner said this song was likely the most played song in the world. And you know what? He might be right because in 1992 when Disneyland Paris opened their version of It's a Small World, It's a Small World from 1992 until the closures for the pandemic was literally playing at all times around the clock around the globe. Because when you've got Small World in California, Florida, Paris, and Tokyo, you can be literally playing this song nonstop. Time Magazine happens to agree with Michael Eisner and they did dub this the most played song in history. And speaking of the song, we have to thank the legendary Sherman Brothers. They are the ones who wrote this classic earworm. And I don't care if it gets stuck in your head. You get it stuck in your head and you like it because this is iconic. This is nostalgic. This is history right here, friends. The Sherman Brothers are famous Disney storytellers and songwriters. We're going to hear more of them in a little bit. But they wrote the music for Mary Poppins, The Jungle Book, and Chain of Tiki Room, Carousel of Progress. And again, it's a small one. And speaking of the song, initially there was not an anthem to this song. Initially when you traveled by boat to these various countries, the children were singing their national anthem. But the Sherman brothers referred to it as a horrible cacophony of music. It was just a bunch of sounds. The songs were all different tunes, different paces, different keys. So Walt asked the Sherman brothers if they could write a simple limerick that would be nursery rhyme-esque, able for anyone to be sung, that could be then sung in different languages. Which is why when you go around on It's a Small World, you'll hear it sung in English, of course, as well as Japanese, Spanish, Italian, and other languages around the world. We can't talk about It's a Small World without talking about some of the other key imagination that brought this to life. For starters, I'd like to mention Rolly Crump. He was, I mentioned in the Haunted Mansion, a little bit unique, a little bit eccentric, and the main contribution he made to It's a Small World was if you looked at the 64-65 World's Fair, there was a large tower outside. It was called the Tower of the Winds, a 110-foot statue and sculpture. Now, that did not move with the attraction when it opened in Disneyland. However, that beautiful facade that you see outside Disneyland Small World, that was also done by Rolly Crump. Have to shout out to Alice Davis. She was wife to Imagineer Mark Davis, one of my favorites, and she was known for her costume work. That was her main role at Imagineering. And as you can imagine, it was a lot of work to costume all of these dolls. She wanted to make sure it was authentic, so she used materials and designs from nations around the world, which proved to be quite a problem. Because of the various movements of the different dolls, she specifically cited things like the African dancers and the Hawaiian dancers. A lot of times the material would rip, so she had to come up with creative solutions to make sure that these dolls maintained their authenticity, but were not ripping their costumes repetitively. 
but the most important person when it comes to It's a Small World, Disney legend Mary Blair. Mary Blair was a color genius. She did concept art for beloved films such as Peter Pan, Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and whenever you look at her style of drawing, you immediately know it's Mary Blair. She had a very unique style. She also was able to mix colors in ways people thought were unheard of. She could look at a color palette and put it together, and it'd be things that you might think would clash or look terrible, but she always made it work. She is the main designer for It's a Small World, she designed all of these dolls. She designs the beautiful facade. She is the hero of It's a Small World. We absolutely adore her. Other notable Mary Blair work inside Walt Disney World is if you go to the Contemporary and there's that beautiful mural on the concourse, that multi-story mural on the fourth floor, that's also Mary Blair art. And with that, let's hop in line at It's a Small World and I'll tell you a few things to look for on the attraction. I'm gonna use the lightning line since I already paid for it today to get through that Peter Pan's flight line. It's a Small World doesn't typically have quite as long of a line as things like Peter Pan's Flight or even things like Mini Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Good job. Thank you. So it's not one you need to use Genie Plus on. However, if you're already purchasing it, it does creep up to the 45 minute or hour range on busy days, and you might as well. When you head inside the tented area of It's a Small World, you'll notice Disney World has a facade as well. It's not quite as grand or beautiful as the one out at Disneyland, but a couple things to look for. One, Disneyland's facade is majority white and gold, whereas here in Walt Disney World, it is a rainbow of colors. They recently repainted it, making it a lot brighter for the 50th, and I think it looks pretty snazzy. I love it. I think Mary Blair would like it too. One color in particular I want to point out is if you look at the clock, you will see all of the different numbers, but the five and the zero have been gold plated. That was added to celebrate the 50th anniversary. And lastly, if you take a look at the design elements, you'll see they included notable structures from around the world, including the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the Taj Mahal, and the Eiffel Tower. Again, this whole thing is about uniting people from around the globe, so they worked in famous features from the world here into the facade. Speaking of that important message, the Small World dolls, there's over 300 of them. You visit 30 countries on this adventure, and every single doll is the exact same. It was important to the Imagineers that all the dolls be the same to represent that we're all the same, and it really is a small world after all. What makes the dolls different are their clothes, are their hair, are their skin colors, but the actual physical dolls themselves were all the same, duplicated over and over. And speaking of their hair, I have a less heartwarming and more terrifying fun fact to tell you. Did you know that the doll's hair grows? It's probably because they're haunted. Or because the hair is made out of yarn, or in Florida where it's very humid, so the yarn naturally stretches out and becomes longer. So once a year or so, the Imagineers have to go in and give all the dolls a little trim so that they look presentable for you. Isn't that nice and not creepy at all? Another thing to look for is you may know the lyrics of the song say that there's just one moon and one golden sun. In every room that you go into, take a look for the golden sun. Additionally, one last story before I board from Walt Disney and when they opened this attraction in 1966 out in Disneyland. Walt asked children from around the world to come be a part of the dedication for the attraction in Disneyland, and each of those children brought water from where they were from, 16 different containers full of 16 different waters from different oceans and waterways around the world, every ocean in the world, and they dumped it into the river at It's a Small World, symbolizing the unifying message of the attraction itself. And what did Walt Disney dump? Well, he actually got water out of the rivers of America in Frontierland and put it in It's a Small World. Unlike attractions like Peter Pan's Flight, which can feel really short, so you can wait in 80 minutes. That said, 8 or 10 minutes of the song is a small world might be too much for you. Just depends on how you look at it. Now, before we head off to the 100 Acre Wood, it's time for one of my favorite segments in the videos. Don't be a jerk in the park, PSA. Today's topic, don't touch the water in a boat ride. This isn't even because it's gross, which it is. It's full of chemicals to make sure it's safe. 
but you could get seriously injured. The amount of times I see both children and adults stick their hands into the water on a boat ride is unbelievable. There are mechanics in there that keep those boats moving forward. There are beams in there that your hand could get wedged in. Watch your kids, and if you're an adult, really? The next attraction on our list, the mini adventures of Winnie the Pooh. I think this is one of the cutest and at this point underrated attractions in the Magic Kingdom. Please don't tell Max because you know what a big Mr. Toad fan he is. And speaking of Mr. Toad, yes, this attraction did replace opening day Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. It was announced that Mr. Toad's Wild Ride would be closing in 1997, and in 1999, Winnie the Pooh, Tigger, to Piglet, Christopher Robin, Eeyore, and the whole Winnie the Pooh gang was welcomed into the spot. Now, I like Mr. Toad's Wild Ride as much as the next person, probably less than Max, but I think it's a really fun attraction. I love riding it when I go out to Disneyland. But you can't blame Disney for replacing Mr. Toad with an incredibly popular IP such as Winnie the Pooh. Go ahead, name a character in Mr. Toad in the Wind of the Willows that's not Mr. Toad. Now, name a Winnie the Pooh character that's not Winnie the Pooh. I bet more of you could do the second one. A lot of people can name Winnie the Pooh characters. There's Tigger, there's Eeyore, there's Piglet, there's Christopher Robin, there's Gopher, there's Owl, there's Rabbit, there's all Kangaroo. There's all kinds of characters you can name from Winnie the Pooh. But you probably can't name Cyril and Angus McBadger and Molly and Mr. Winky and the Weasels from Mr. Toad. So Disney wanted to put in one of the more popular IPs and unfortunately that was the end of the Wild Ride. Now you probably know that Winnie the Pooh is not a Disney original story. No, it was written by a British author named A. A. Milne who had a son named Christopher who had all these different stuffed animals and he would make stories with them. So A. A. Milne wrote them down and they became the mini adventures of Winnie the Pooh. But while Disney's daughters, Diane and Sharon, loved these stories, they were some of his favorites that Walt would read to him. So he wanted to share them with all of the American audience. The Walt Disney Company eventually acquired the rights to Winnie the Pooh in 1961 and they started debuting them to the American audience in shorts. And then they've compiled the initial three shorts into the mini adventures of Winnie the Pooh, the full length animated film. And Winnie the Pooh has been steadily gaining popularity ever since. It makes sense that they want to put this attraction in there because behind Mickey Mouse, Winnie the Pooh was the number two most popular character on Disney merchandise for a very long time. Between you and me, I think some Frozen sisters may have him beat at this point, but I'm not going to tell them. Last thing I'll say about A.A. Milne and the history of the Pooh characters in general is that kind of a weird connection is that in 1929, A.A. Milne wrote a poem called Toad of Toad Hall based on the story Wind in the Willows. So just kind of a nice full circle moment, right? Speaking of a full circle moment, one thing you can look for on the attraction is that when you head into Owl's house uh, in your honey pot, you're going to be able to see two nods to Mr. Toad's wild ride. One, you will see Mr. Toad handing the deed of the property over to Owl, and you will see Molly and Winnie the Pooh into the portraits within the house. So maybe, just maybe, Mr. Toad was okay with it. Or maybe Winnie the Pooh is a real estate mogul. Who's to say? Another character I always love seeing on the attraction and in the queue is Gopher. And I like Gopher because Gopher's not in the original story. He's not one of A.A. A. Milne's characters. However, in the cartoon, in the mini adventures of Winnie the Pooh, one of the other characters tells Gopher they'll call him and he's, they say they're going to look him up in the phone book. And he says, you can't. I'm not in the book. A phone book, kids, was a book that was delivered to everybody's house and it was free and it had everybody's phone number listed on there so you could call them on your landline. A landline is a phone that was connected to your house that you had to stand there and talk on. You couldn't walk around with it. You had to dial with buttons. And buttons are these physical things you had to push on the phone. Before we jump in line for the ride, we are going to pop into Mr. Sanders' house right here inside this tree. You may know that this is where Pooh lives. There's his mailbox if you didn't know. You can ring the bell. You can't. The little thing isn't in there. But most importantly, this tree was transplanted from across the street, which is where 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea used to exist. So now my adult-sized body is going to climb into this child-sized house and show you this hidden nautilus carved into the tree as a nod to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I guess that was the easier way. Additionally, on the back side of Mr. Sanders' house, you can see a hidden Mickey carved into the wood right there. That's right, Max, a hidden Mickey carved into the queue at Winnie the Pooh. Are we still friends? 
Winnie the Pooh does have one of the most fun queues in all of Walt Disney World, especially for your little ones. It's an interactive garden with Rabbit. It was one of the first uses of the interactive queue. You've also got that touchscreen honey wall. So while this one can get longer lines from time to time, you'll see it 45 minutes or an hour or so. If it's 30 minutes or less, you may want to jump in standby because your kids will have fun playing. Also, how cute is it that the beehive is up hanging in Mr. Sanders' tree? If you're familiar with the cartoon, you know that Pooh is continuously trying to get that beehive so he can get his beloved honey. A couple more things to know about the attraction itself is that this opened at Walt Disney World before Disneyland, another one of those rare chances, two-in-one video, who'd have thunk it? But what's really cool about this version of the attraction is that it has the original voice actors for both Tigger and Piglet. Paul Winchell initially voiced Tigger, John Fielder initially voiced Piglet, both passed away a day apart in 2005, and their voices aren't used on the other iterations of this attraction around the world. Additionally on the attraction, pay attention to those storybook chapters. You're supposed to be going through a chapter book much like the A.A. Milne stories, which is why each scene acts like a new chapter of a book, and you'll see one of the pages as you go through. And last but not least, we gotta talk about the ride vehicle itself. You are gonna climb aboard a honey pot and go through the story. And these vehicles are really cool. They used brand new technology to motion enhance them so that they could do things like float on the water and bounce with Tigger. And the reason they bounce with Tigger is because when Imagineer were coming up with a Winnie the Pooh attraction. They surveyed kids in the parks and said, what would you want to do if you could go to the 100 Acre Wood? And the number one answer was Bounce with Tigger. have one more stop in Fantasyland before we skitty scat back to Tomorrowland, but this time we are headed into New Fantasyland, which was the expansion from 2012 that brought us Enchanted Tales with Belle, which still hasn't returned, Be Our Guest Restaurant, Seven Doors Mine Train, and My Nemesis in Giant Form. That's right, friends. It's time to talk about Under the Sea, Journey of the Little Mermaid, which means Ursula. But before we can talk about an attraction based on The Little Mermaid, we gotta talk about the classic animated film, The Little Mermaid. The movie almost didn't happen because the movie Splash was also in production at the time, and the studio heads, including Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg, didn't want Disney to be known as the Mermaid Studio and only making mermaid films. Eventually, however, the classic story tale of good and evil, the Danish story, did win out and they decided to make The Little Mermaid, but that's why Ariel's hair is red. They wanted her to be very different from Daryl Hannah's mermaid character in Splash. And speaking of things that almost didn't happen, the part of your world number was almost cut. However, the lyricist and musical genius Howard Ashman insisted that this song be part of the story. He insisted that it was crucial to understanding Ariel and her motives throughout the rest of the film. She needed that moment. Studio execs weren't sure that kids would like to sit through a kind of like long, slow hero song. And initially when they played it for people, their reaction wasn't good. But Howard Ashman kept insisting that they needed it and eventually convinced them. And as they showed it to more and more people, more and more people loved Part of Your World. And Part of Your World to this day is one of the most popular and most beloved Disney songs of all time. Under the Sea Journey, The Little Mermaid takes the classic Disney dark ride with an Omni Mover and puts you right into the story of The Little Mermaid. And it is a very cute attraction. Taking out my Auntie Ursula bias, this is a wonderful dark ride with wonderful animatronics and great music. Again, thanks to Howard Ashman as well as Alan Mencken. There's actually almost 200 animatronics in this attraction, which is a lot. And almost 70% of them are in one scene, the Under the Sea scene. And speaking of Under the Sea, it won Howard Ashman and Alan Mencken making an Oscar for Best Original Song. In addition to those almost 200 animatronics, there's almost 20,000, 20,000, you heard me correctly, plants in and out of this attraction within the queue, within the setting area, within the ride itself. Now, those are real and fake plants, but still 20,000, that is a bonkers huge number. But as I've talked about it before, plant life and landscaping is crucial to the theming and the setting of wherever you are in the Disney parks. They have to tell the story so that you believe you're truly gonna go under the sea with Ariel. And by having palm trees and other nautical seas type plants as you weave through the queue and get into the attraction, it's telling your brain that you are somewhere different than when you're say, 
over in France at Bell's Castle. One of the reasons that people love this attraction is because of the incredible animatronics. I already told you there's an incredible volume of them, but the Imagineers had to actually develop new technology for these animatronics that they hadn't had to use before. Because Ariel and King Triton show more skin than previous animatronics, they had to develop a new skin that would look realistic for Ariel when he, she's in her seashell top and King Triton when he's flexing those pecs a la Terry Crews. They also had to use this skin for Ursula. Ursula in this attraction sits seven and a half feet tall and 12 feet wide. She's incredibly intimidating for everyone, not just me who has a childhood phobia of the sea witch. She's also sitting up on a raised platform as compared to your clam mobile, so she seems even more threatening and imposing. And I gotta say, it works. She's incredibly lifelike, and even I have to admit, an incredibly amazing animatronic. We're going standby at this attraction, not only because it only is a 10 minute wait, it's a great filler ride in between those lightning lanes, but because two of the very cool things about this attraction live within the queue, including the coolest hidden Mickey of all time. Now this attraction sits where 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea used to be, so there's some cool nods to 20,000 Leagues. One you can see, one you're going to have to trust me on. The one you can see is right across the way in the rock work here. You can see the Nautilus carved into the wall again. They just love carving Nautiluses at Imagineering. This is the second one we've seen. Uh, but again, they are paying tribute to the former attraction here by carving the ship into the side of the rock work. The one you're going to have to trust me on is that the Imagineers, when they closed down 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, long before this became Under the Sea Journey of the Little Mermaid, the Imagineers made sure to keep a bottle of water from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. It sat in Imagineering for 18 years, and then when they opened this attraction, they added it to the water system here, thus uniting the old and new attractions together. We're getting a lot of water dumping in this episode, too. Huh. I like to imagine that there's just a room at Imagineering and it's just like jars of old water with like labels that are like 20,000 leagues, Epcot Fountain. That's what my dream is. If you've been to Imagineering and confirm this, let me know. Now, time for the coolest hidden Mickey of all time and you're not even going to be able to see it right now, but let me explain. If you look right here in the rock work car closest to me, you will see the top part of a Mickey carved out. You've got ear, ear. Now look further beyond, look to the rock work that's closest to the sky, and you're going to see the bottom half of that same Mickey, the bottom half of the ears and the face. Is this the most abstract hidden Mickey of all time? Am I reaching? Is this really a hidden Mickey? Yes, it is the coolest hidden Mickey of all time. Why? Because this hidden Mickey only appears once a year. It appears once a year on November 18th, Mickey Mouse's birthday. The sun is at the right trajectory in the sky that when it hits through both of those two uh, rock cutouts, it makes a hidden Mickey shadow on the wall. The Imagineers are geniuses. Who thought of that? That's unbelievable. But yes, that is the coolest hidden Mickey ever. Unfortunately, more than a few years, it's had cloud cover or been raining, so you haven't been able to see it, but when it works, it's amazing. And if one super awesome hidden Mickey wasn't enough at this attraction, this one boasts the second coolest hidden Mickey in my opinion as well. It's actually a steamboat willy built into the rocks at the exit of the attraction. And it's very difficult to see, but I promise once you do, you won't be able to unsee it. First of all, I want you to put in your brain the image of steamboat willy driving the, the ship, driving the boat, right? He's gonna be from the side facing to the left. Now we're gonna start here at the bottom with this rock formation closest to me. Down at the very bottom right here, that's Mickey's foot and his leg goes up. And then in the rocks, you'll see one of the buttons from his pants. Jump to the second rock back there. You're gonna see the other half of his pants, the other button. And if you look down his other leg and his other shoe. Following that same rock up above his pants, you're gonna see his arms stretched out. And then his face is laying flat like this on the rock with his nose right here, his eye. If you look past that it carved into the rock that's kind of forming the wall there, you'll see the wheel and his other arm. And even further past that, the rock all the way back there is his hat. So if you were to lay that classic image of Steamboat Willie on this rock formation, it would create a perfect hidden Mickey. Those 
two super dope hidden Mickeys almost make up for that giant or something. But in all seriousness, I do really like that attraction. I think it's an awesome filler ride. I love any Disney dark ride that's going to put me in the middle of a story. Can't deny how much I love the soundtrack of The Little Mermaid, so it's a great one. Now we've got one more attraction. We're headed back to Tomorrowland. And I gave you a hint earlier about what we were going to do last. Anyone remember? And at last, we are at Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress, which may technically not be one of the most popular rides in the park, but it's certainly one of the most historically important rides in the park. It's got some of the best details, secrets, backstory, and Easter eggs in the park. And I figure if you've held on for this long, you'll want to know that stuff. Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress made its debut at the 6465 World's Fair as a partnership between the Disney Company and General Electric. It was meant to show off the new technology and how Progress and GE have supported you throughout the last century. Carousel of Progress follows the same family throughout about a hundred years. Well, it wasn't quite a hundred years when it first opened. The first scene takes place right at the turn of the century, the late 1890s. Then you head into the 20s, then the 40s, and then it used to end in the 60s. These days, it ends in the far off distant future of the year 2000. The Carousel of Progress was a smash hit at the 6465 World's Fair, so much so that they decided to bring it back to Disneyland after the event. Walt Disney was pretty genius in that way. He had other people pay to build attractions for the World's Fair that he could then pick up and take back to Disneyland and put in his theme park where he could charge people to come see them pretty smart. Then in 1973, General Electric wanted a new audience to be exposed to all their amazing products, so they moved it from Disneyland to the Magic Kingdom. And what's interesting about the family going through the years is not only are they going through a century, but they're actually going through a calendar year. You can tell this by the holidays they celebrate. In the first scene, they are celebrating Valentine's Day, followed by the 4th of July, then Halloween, and finally Christmas. So you're moving through with this family, not only again through about a hundred year period, but through a calendar holiday as well. The Carousel of Progress is considered to be the longest running show in American theater history because basically since 1964, it's been running nonstop, either in New York, in California, or of course, now in Florida. Gonna bring up our friends, the Sherman Brothers again. They wrote the anthem for this one, Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow. That was the original song you heard in the attraction. However, when it moved here and they wrote a new song called Now Is The Best Time Of Your Life. Then when it went through renovations in the 90s, they switched it back to Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow. However, you can still hear Now Is The Best Time Of Your Life in the background music and that kind of symphonic techie style that you hear throughout Tomorrowland. It's that do 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 if you hear that tune when you're in Tomorrowland that is the Sherman Brothers now is the best time of your life but what's important about Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow is that they wrote it for one man and one man only and that was Walt Disney that song is actually an anthem an ode to Walt and his genius mind that brought all of this here if you replace in the lyrics the word man with the name Walt you'll hear what I'm talking about the lyrics say man had a dream and that's the star he followed his dream with mind and heart and when it becomes a reality it's a dream come true for you and me if you put walt in there i'd say we're living in walt's dream become reality so that's just like a nice tender all moment any attraction that walt disney personally supervised i'm gonna have a soft spot for but i particularly love that story now on that sentimental note enough jibber jabbering from me it's time to get inside the carousel of progress which is a rotating theater it's about a 20 minute show you have to be able to sit there for the entire 20 minutes if you get up and leave it will force the entire theater to watch the same scene over again and then they'll be mad at you and nobody wants that but a few things to listen and look for first of all in the first scene you're going to hear the father acknowledge the robins outside the window and you'll be able to see them legend has it those are the same robins used in the spoonful of sugar scene in mary poppins in the second scene you'll look out the window and you'll see a sign for herb ryman attorney at law if you remember from earlier, Herb Ryman is the Imagineer that did the original concept art for Cinderella Castle, as well as several other attractions, so that's a nod to him. Walt Disney himself picked out the original cast. He wanted them to have a Missourian drawl like his childhood. Walt finally remembered his time in Marceline, Missouri. Walt is also the one that insisted on having a dog in every scene because it was what a good old American family would have, and it was what he called a weenie or something to draw your eye throughout the story. 
Initially, the father figure was voiced by Rex Allen, the great Western actor nicknamed the American Cowboy. Rex Allen now voices the grandfather, and the father is voiced by Gene Shepard, who most notably narrated A Christmas Story. Another voice you'll hear is Mel Blanc. He voices old Uncle Arvel. Mel Blanc was known as the man of a thousand voices, famously voicing characters like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck for Looney Tunes. However, this is the only work you will ever hear Mel Blanc perform for Disney. The other character he recorded was Gideon the Cat in Pinocchio. However, they decided to make Gideon a silent, kind of drunk character, so all you'll hear from Mel Blanc there is a hiccup. If you take a look at the grandmother, you may recognize her from Haunted Mansion. I mentioned that in the last version of this story. And speaking of Haunted Mansion and Halloween, during the Halloween scene, take a look at the son's desk. He has a photo of his sister on the desk because he says he's using a picture of his sister to be the inspiration for his jack-o'-lantern. And what's hilarious is it's literally a picture of the animatronic. Also in the Halloween scene behind the sun, you are going to see he has a Red Rider BB gun as a nod to Gene Shepard in A Christmas Story. In the Halloween scene, you can also check out that the radio behind Dad is set to 64, as in 1964. And in the final scene, the Christmas scene, you will notice that on the bulletin board, there is a sticky note that says Marty called once changes. That's about Marty Scalar, an incredible Imagineer, oversaw the... Uh, basically all of Epcot when it first opened. He oversaw the 1993 revamping of this attraction and he was incredibly particular. So to kind of poke jest at him, the other Imagineers put that note on the bulletin board and it's been here ever since. In the third scene, the daughter has a magazine with Rex Allen on the cover. Therefore, both dad characters have a nod within the attraction. Now all of that is incredible. It's amazing. We're gonna go on the ride right now, but the biggest question I have, the biggest mystery is still unsolved. What happens to the second daughter? In the very first scene, there are two daughters. There's Sarah, the wife, there's the dad, there's the son, there's the older daughter, and there's a younger girl helping the mother with her laundry. But she never appears in any of the other scenes. Where does she go? Oh, shining at the end of every day. The ads in the paper for months for a movie starring Al Jolson. And he's going to talk. Oh, that's no big deal. Anybody can do that voice activated stuff. Watch it. Robert, Love a little spin on the COP. And you know what I noticed? They recently changed the outfits on the last scene. Because, you know, that's the same as updating it to be past the year 2000. Uh, and the dad has an apron on that says, My Food Rocks. And I can't help but assume that's a nod to the retired Epcot attraction, Food Rocks. Well, friends, that is a wrap on Chapter 2 of the Best Kept Secrets of Magic Kingdom Attractions. Which one was your favorite? What should we do next? We can go back to the parks again. We can do Not Ride Secrets. You let me know what you want to see down in the comments. In the meantime, friends, make sure to rate, review, subscribe to our channel, follow us on social. And until next time, friends, I'm Molly, and it's been magical. Bye! Now go watch Episode 1.